So welcome to today's episode of Learning Unboxed. As always, we are super excited because we get to have conversations that help us collectively think very deeply, very differently um, in community conversations. And so today we have a pretty special treat um, because we are going to be, and we're going to wait for Travis to, to Chris to come back. <laughs> I'm going to do it again. All right. You feeling pretty stable, Chris? Yeah, I, I hope so. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you you went completely black in terms of oh, your screen. Yeah, yeah. You you disappeared. <laughs> I think I think I think it's okay. I hope it's okay. Okay. All right. We're gonna try it again. <laughs> and if it happens again, we'll just know that you'll you'll keep coming back, and Derek and I will continue the conversation, and we'll sort of see how it all flows. All right. So I'm gonna do the introduction again. We already had our moment of silence. My sound engineers, hopefully they actually listen as they're editing, right? Um, and so they know that we're gonna start again. <laughs> All right. So today on Learning in Box, we have a special treat because we're going to have a conversation that allows us to think very critically, to think deeply, um, and to really think about community and what it means um, to be part of, of a community on so many different levels. And so joining me today is um, Christopher Travers and Derek Tillman Kelly. And we're gonna talk about the Communion Collective and what that all means. So gentlemen, welcome. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. So just a little bit of context for our listeners. Um, Christopher or Chris um, Travers is a scholar, minister, a writer, a speaker, and curator of communion. Um, anchored in an ethic of love, his work explores the intersection of spirituality, race, and gender among Black men. So super excited about that conversation. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Absolutely. And joining Chris today is, um, is Derek Tillman Kelly, who serves as the Chief of Staff for the Dean of the College of Engineering at The Ohio State University. And so I'm super excited to sort of see how the two of you connect um, for this conversation. So Derek, welcome to you as well. Thank you. So I want to get started today just very, very high level, recognizing that um, you know, our listeners come from all over the world. So Chris, talk to us just a little bit, first and foremost, about what this notion of a communion collective is. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great way to begin. Uh, so, so a communion for me, honestly, is at the core of it, it's about relationship, right? It's, it's, um, it's a two-part relationship, right? So it's, it's a spiritual connection, in the sense with our creator, but then it's also this, this horizontal union that we have with one another. And I think oftentimes when folks have, have heard the, the concept of communion, particularly within faith and form spaces, it's sort of like a ritual. And I think of it as being something that's every day and everywhere we go. Anytime that we are sort of connected, embraced by community, I think we are living and doing communion, right? And so the communion collective is really just a group of artists who are committed or passionate about bringing this notion of communion within every fabric of life, particularly within educational spaces, faith informed practices, as well as scholarly pursuits. Absolutely. And wow, that's a great way to, to sort of help everybody understand that. So thank you very, very much for that. So Derek, help us understand sort of your connection in this space with what Chris is talking about. So I, I think I probably have a pretty good sense of that, but help our listeners out by understanding sort of what role you play in this conversation. Yeah, so the honest answer is that I'm all things cheerleader for Chris. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's the quick way to say it. But in reality, I've sort of been a partner in Chris's walk um, mm -hmm. and life. Um, he came to Columbus for doctoral study at Ohio State and but the day that we met, we talked both about his interest in exploring education, but also in his call to ministry and his desire um, to be intentional about the ways in which those two things intersect. Because often we were told that the formal structures of education and the sort of formal structures of religion or faith don't aren't meant to be brought together. And Chris didn't believe that. And so I've gotten to sort of walk alongside as he's sort of brought the two things together, but also be a sounding board to think about how these things might work, and then ultimately to be a benefactor and beneficiary um, of the ways in which he sort of brought the community collective into existence. 
Yeah, absolutely. I love that. So, so Chris, that was a perfect segue. So Derek, thank you for that, uh, that bridge that you provided there. So, cause I do want to talk a little bit about your, your graduate work, because I get the sense, right. That a lot of that sort of piece of your journey has really informed the way you're thinking about and doing the work that you are now. And for our listeners, just to sort of have a sense of what's going on, you know, currently you are serving as a visiting assistant press professor at Denison university, uh, which is also here in Ohio, as well as a lecturer at Ohio State University. Um, and you've really been in a lot of work and space around thinking about men and masculinity, um, race and gender, and sort of the, the intersection of all these roles in what I hope becomes a conversation as part of this around making um, a lot of your work very, very tangible broadly, right? Today, the here and the now. So let's yeah. talk a little bit about that journey for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think, you know, Derek got us started, you know, when I when I got to school, um, you know, I had a little bit of experience in ministry and working with students, working with younger people. And I thought that, you know, I sort of had to push those skills or experiences to the side and uh, become socialized, like to the field of, of, of the academy, right? <laughs> academia, uh, so, it is wicked, wicked <laughs> academia, right? <laughs> yeah, it's this whole monster, right? And so, uh, what I realized, though, over over the course of my my studies, was it was the relationships that really like got me, moved me forward, right? It was it was the spiritual connection that really pushed me forward. So some of the things that I thought that I had to turn away, really was what anchored me during my time in graduate studies, right? And so I found my success in in sort of like remembering and drawing back to what I would call now communion. And so I realized that. Um, there is a way for me to bring the essence or the spirit of what community represents in my life into the classroom, just as much as I can bring some of the conversations and the exercises and the pedagogical practices within ministry. And I also began to realize that the students that I would engage, right, because I had worked with undergraduate students at Ohio State University, they also appreciated my approach, right? At, at the core of, of what, I, what I'm trying to do in communion is a level of humanizing Mm -hmm. right the, the educational spaces right um keeping love at the forefront right valuing the person over the product taking the time to engage in relational experiences more than some of the things that the academy will prioritize are important and so i realized that that those are sort of like the that, that's the secret sauce mm -hmm. right to mm -hmm unlocking the potential in students to empowering them were some of the very same elements that I had learned growing up in my faith. And so really during my graduate stage, I think I built a level of confidence around approaching things in my own way, which is really just breaking down the barriers between faith informed spaces and educational spaces mm -hmm. and kind of just bringing the worlds together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And definitely, you know, not just a piece that we need, right? But I do think that there are so many lessons learned, so many values and understanding the humanity of the work that we are collectively doing. So, you know, and, and I did, did make a reference, you know, talking about, you know, sort of wicked academia. And, and I, I was very deliberate about that. And, you know, from my, most of my listeners know, um, you know, uh, my, my background and work is as an anthropologist, you know, and as a university faculty member myself, right? And so, you know, I do think, and I, I, I feel a bit um, sort of sort of of your journey with you because I have also found that if we're not mindful, right, mindful, mm -hmm. that we that there is a, an interesting dichotomy and tangible disconnect sometimes that happens in post secondary and pushes down into K twelve. That really, I think we lose the human in the journey, yeah. right? Um, and, you know, certainly one of the things that we advocate for all the time um, at past and the work that we do is, you know, recognizing you have to meet people and systems where mm -hmm. they are. We, we can't make great meaningful change if we don't recognize that we are in the moment for a collective set of reasons. So Derek, I, well, on that note, I wanna turn a little bit to you, right? You know, because, you know, not only are you Chris's champion and cheerleader, and I love that, um, but more importantly, I suspect because of your role at the university from an administrative standpoint, you get to see the very things that Chris is talking about playing out in real time across a broad sector of the institution. And I realize you may not be, you know, here to speak specifically from the institution perspective, but I am really curious as you've watched and participated in Chris's journey and the work that's happening, 
Um, we're going to circle back around, oh, by the way, with you, Chris, about the, the conversation about thinking about your, your, your students and the way you interact with them. But before we get there, Derek, I want to understand from you, what are you seeing sort of in the landscape of post-secondary right now that is a deliberate sort of work and shift to sort of change this paradigm we're talking about? So I think there are probably two things. So I'm, I'm fairly fresh in my role as chief of staff, but also worked for an alliance of universities prior. Mm -hmm. And the reality is lots of folks want to serve students well, mm -hmm. and they want to serve the fullness of students, right? We talk a lot more about students mm -hmm. identities and how that shapes what they bring with them into college. But the reality is without some intentional and explicit engagement, Mm -hmm. We fail time and time again. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to um, denigrate the institutions that we are a part of. But at the same time, we often talk about student success. And the reality is when institutions were talking about student success, they were talking about institutional metrics that sort of left right. the mm -hmm. humanity of mm -hmm. students mm -hmm. on the side, right? So mm -hmm. we talked about graduation rates with, yes, certainly, um, spark and influence what students can do with their lives, but we didn't talk about students' ability to articulate what they wanted from mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is not everybody who goes into post-secondary spaces are thinking about fully four-year degrees right. or graduate degrees. Right. And if we can only articulate our success in them achieving a metric that someone else is measuring them on, we sort of miss the possibility. And so I think as we push into spaces where we want to be more fully um, thoughtful of who the students are, it requires us to not just acknowledge identities, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. we can call them first gen, we can call right. them students of color, we can call them from low, in, low, low resource communities mm -hmm. or families. Mm -hmm. But if we tell them, cool, we recognize that, and now I want you to come and fit the mold of the, the typical student, which, you know, when we say traditional students and that sort of thing, you're like, but the things, the people that we call traditional aren't the majority of students in higher ed. Right, right. Push that to the side. Right. And so I think a lot of that for me then means how do we actually honor the commitments that we've articulated to students where we're not just labeling them and then telling them to be who the other students have been, but mm -hmm. actually changing the ways in which we go through orientation mm -hmm. or we deal with registration of courses or that we celebrate their successes along the way, right? Because I, I think in our current frame at Ohio State, there's a new interest in students pursuing multiple um, possibilities. So mm -hmm. yes, we want you to get a degree when you come mm -hmm. here, but we also want you to be an entrepreneur right. and think about the things that tug at your heart or soul in ways that allow you to change the world. And you don't have to wait until you graduate from Ohio State or other right. places um, to begin making that, that broader impact in the world. And so in many ways, I think that is sort of how I've thought about Chris's journey too, mm -hmm. right? Like he didn't have to get his PhD right. before he could start thinking about the ways in which he served the fullness of students. Right, absolutely. And I really do love that because again, one of those things that we see all the time, right? And the, the entire student journey, personally, you know, I'm conflicted, you know, in terms of, you know, because I spent a tremendous amount of time working with a variety of students um, across that sort of PK-20 spectrum, but a lot of our time, full transparency and disclosure, it's it's really that sweet spot of upper elementary through, through high school with students. And it's a time in their lives where they're just struggling mightily with everything under the sun, you know, the traditional you know, kid, tween, and teenager angst, the, the world discovery, the, the disparities, the advantage, the, you know, what am I going to do? People still asking me, what do you want to be when you grow up? Wrong question to ask a kid, by the way. Right. Um, you know, and, and that whole sort of just mix, if you will, that is the growing up of life but it's becoming increasingly difficult in my mind to be able to have a conversation with a student that says, oh, by the way, you need to go to college. That's a whole different space that we're occupying. And I appreciate, Derek, the way you, you couch that. And Chris, so I'm really curious as it relates to the work that you're doing specifically with students, they, you know, they're showing up there and they may be there because they got community pressure. They may be there because they got an awesome scholarship they couldn't say no to. They may have gotten there because their parents pushed them and a whole host of all these other reasons that kids today show up in post-secondary. And some of those reasons are fabulous and wonderful and are the exact thing that a kiddo needs, but sometimes they show up there and it's 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 not and yet 
some of them persist, some of them choose not to. What, what does this notion of communion collective and the way that you do your work specifically with students, I wanna dig into that. How, how does your role then help these individuals find their path and their journey? At the end of the day, it's about happiness and engagement and fulfillment. How do we get there inside of a post-secondary structure? And I know that is a loaded question, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so I'll speak from like two two vantage points. One, I'll speak from like the the community collective, but then I'll also talk about some of the years of experience I have within higher education and student mm -hmm. affairs that I've engaged in with students. Um, and so, so for for the most part, as a as a higher education scholar practitioner. You know, I've had most of my experiences in the classroom mm -hmm. and a few in some co-curricular spaces. And I think one of, one of the one of the things that I do in both in community collective and in my work in higher ed um, is, is try to curate space. So I talked about, you know, and I think in the bio, you said like curator of communion, right? Mm -hmm. I, I do my best to create spaces that, um, that, 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 that have a certain set of conditions, right? And I allow the spaces to really help to, to help to, to move the students forward. So within the space, right? Like, and students realize this early on after being in my presence for like a day or two, they, they start to, to learn some of the conditions in the space. And so love is in the space. I feel like we're in a culture where we talk about love, but we don't, we don't talk, we don't name love, right? Mm -hmm. So all of the literature that we have around belonging and connection and acceptance and affirming students, at the core of that, to me, what I hear is love. And so I name it explicitly but beyond naming it like I demonstrated I take the time to to, un to understand my students in terms of how they receive love what, what are their love languages right like we we do all of this work when we think about romantic relationship of how we give and receive love but we don't we don't talk about it when it relates to students right and love is still important love language is still important mm -hmm. so that's one of the things I try to bring into the space um, I created a dynamic where we are co-constructing and oftentimes when you think about uh professors or administrators or even like faith-based leaders there's always this sort of this, this separation between the leader and those who are following right mm -hmm. like this, this hierarchy if you will and one of the things that's always prioritized in any space that i curate is a level of vulnerability and a level of transparency and, and it's not because at least i'm interested in just you know sharing my business with mm -hmm. folks mm -hmm. but i'm trying to model what it looks like to to admit that i don't have it all figured out right to admit that like I need grace just like you need grace mm -hmm. to admit that like I'm still on this journey. You mentioned, right, like never to ask a kid, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? I'm still trying to figure out I what know. it is I want to do. <laughs> Me up. too. Full disclosure. <laughs> and, and I think like I think as leaders, we underestimate the importance of a student mm -hmm. or a person that's younger than us being able to see themselves in us, mm -hmm. right? Such that, like, oh, Chris, like you struggle sometimes getting out of the bed in the morning, or like you are still working on time management, or like <laughs> You miss deadlines from time to time or like you slip up and say something that you don't mean like I think students need to see mm -hmm. that right that's also a level of humanizing the space so transparency vulnerability love are demonstrated in the space and when you start when you set the conditions because mm -hmm. students really really yearn for these things contrary to what we might think when you set the conditions then the students themselves within the community begin to to transfer it and even when I'm not around mm -hmm. it exists and so those three conditions, in my in my opinion, have been would have been most helpful within the community collective and in my work as a as a professor or as a scholar. The vulnerability, the transparency, and like the the naming of love, right? And we can define it in a lot of ways, but I think of patience, I think of kindness, I think of gentleness, I think of forgiveness, I think of grace, I think of mercy, right? These are the kind of things that I think embody what love looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but. And I'm gonna circle circle back around with you just, just a touch here, Chris, and then I'm gonna get Derek to respond to this. I'm really, really curious inside of a educational institution, especially one, and we'll, we'll pick on Ohio State just a little bit here, right? Only because of the size of it, right? It is a massive institution and we talk about it a lot here locally in our community, right? Because it, it is, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an anchor institution um, within our community. It's large, it employs a huge number of people. Um, it's got a so many different things that are happening across the university ecosystem 
And there are so many students who show up here from not just locally, but from, from all over the world, right? And so how, how do you then take your experiences, your work, your, your philosophy around the way you engage with the student experience? Because I really, really love this, but how, how does that translate into others, right? So, so how the other, if you will, you know, the adults, the, the, the instructors, the, you know, I'm using adults in, in the most generic of, of term here, right? Because, you know, all, all the participants in the university system are adults, but they're young, and in many cases inexperienced. And, and as we all collectively here and know, you know, there, there's an awful lot of mentorship that happens or should happen at that piece of somebody's journey, because it's all about transitions, and it's about self discovery. So how do you take the the amazing work that you're doing and the philosophical point of view that says i'm going to start by recognizing that everybody that walks into to my sphere of experience is a valuable human being and translate that across an institution that not so much has marginalized that but it's not necessarily embraced as an everyday practice on behalf of our students yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think, um, and Derek, you can jump in if you would like, but I think part of it is, so I, I recognize my limitations, right? I can't like, I can't be in every single space talking to every single person um, offering, you know, these, these set of ideas. There's a, there's a concept within the, the Christian tradition that I think it's also, it shows up within educational spaces and it's a notion of discipleship. Mm -hmm. And so I bring, I bring a, a similar kind of like focus into educational spaces. So by that I mean, there are certain there are certain leaders, right, or individuals, influencers are the concept that folks might use in the social media right. world, right? Yeah. And so um, my my hope is that like the the six to ten, right, leaders or influencers or you know change makers on campus or within like a, a faith informed space, right? I spend intimate time with them. So I may not spend I may not spend intimate time with everybody, but I spend intimate time with them, right? And so. Um, as, as I'm sort of like pouring into them and offering them like a perspective and a framework of how we can approach this, these, these opportunities with students, my hope is that they then go into their spaces and sort of like emulate a similar dynamic, if that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. so I spend, I spend intimate time and energy with the leaders, right? The, the folks who I feel like have the ability to impact other spaces. So during my time at Ohio State, that might have been like folks who were in leadership within the Black Student Union. That might have been folks who were in leadership within the Multicultural Center. That might have been folks who, who had who had influence within the higher education and student affairs program, right? And so, like as they move into their different spheres, helping them see how they can also bring some of those same conditions into spaces. And I feel like that is an approach that I use to try to infiltrate more of the larger ecosystem without me myself having to be in every single space. It's just one of you, after all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Derek, what are your thoughts about that? Because same question back to you, right? You know, and, and it is one of those pieces that as a faculty member, I struggled with mightily, especially when I was a new and young faculty member, it's been many years now. Um, <laughs> but it was really, really tough to sort of figure out your, your, your place in that sort of post-secondary hierarchy, right? Which is incredibly hierarchical, right? It's based on traditions that have long since passed relevancy not even at the uh, the table in conversation oftentimes with our colleagues and so how do you take an approach that is so incredibly student centric recognizing the, the the humanity of it all and 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 take that and make it more of the norm across the ecosystem of the the folks who are actually there spending time quite frankly um you know with with all of these young professionals trying to figure out their way in the world so I think there are probably two things, which I realize I say a lot now. Um, the first one is I was told very early on when I got to Ohio State that while we want everyone to be a Buckeye, um, not everyone will show up as a Buckeye in the same way. Mm -hmm. And what I think the person meant was it is a lot easier in some ways for undergraduates to feel a connection to the broad institution, mm -hmm. right? Because you tend to be a bit more immersed in athletics you tend to be a bit more immersed in student organizations. And so they might hear, I am an Ohio State Buckeye very readily. 
But when you move into the like, graduate spaces, for example, you tend to be a lot more isolated from the institution. You're not going to mm-hmm. all of mm-hmm. the events that are happening in the same way. And so when we started talking about retention, the reality was, I need you to be connected to an aspect of Ohio State. It does not need to be the same. Um, And that does two things realistically. One is it that reminds you that even if you feel not fully connected to the football team, me, honestly, um, (laughs) that doesn't mean that you're not a true Buckeye. It just means that the ways in which you connect to the institution are different and we should honor that difference. And so it means being willing and able to articulate the various opportunities that people can use to engage. The second part though, is I think it's about modeling what we desire. Mm -hmm. And the reality Mm -hmm. is Chris was honest when he said that he curates space as well. And then people sort of think about curation in very different ways after they've been in those spaces with him. And then you start curating your space differently. And so as chief of staff, part of my job is to advise the dean, but I've also had the privilege of watching lots of senior leaders. Mm -hmm. And the reality is the institution unintentionally often takes the tone and tenor um, of their senior senior leaders. So for example, I joined the college six weeks ago and the first week I heard that meetings in the College of Engineering start three minutes late because living in the world of virtual reality, right, the virtual world, the dean wanted to ensure that folks had the chance to get in before she pushed agendas forward. Mm -hmm. And so people took that as a, here's a little bit of grace for folks who might be slightly delayed, but I don't think that she was doing it with the the intent of pushing a behavior, but people watched the behavior, recognized the value of the behavior, and then began to implement their own versions of it. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we work with senior leaders, they might be busy all the time, but when the President Johnson randomly stops on the Oval to ask a student how their experience is, people notice it and more people begin to stop um, less familiar students and right. ask them about their experience in ways that might allow them to share with the broader institution where we're struggling, um, but also to reinforce to students that, yes, this is a really large place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yes, there are 60 some thousand students and 50 some thousand employees. But no, you're not just your ID number. Um, You are, in fact, more than your name dot number. You are a human that we want to make sure feels connected, feels like they have access to leaders who might be able to influence things that aren't working as well. Uh, And and then continuing to check in with folks in ways that allow us to say, we really do see you as a human on this campus. Mm -hmm. And even though it may not be perfect all the time, because no organization or institution is, we will do everything in our power to ensure that you have a voice and a place um, to share with us where things are working for you, where things aren't working so well, and how we might be better administrators, faculty, et cetera, um, to sort of push the goal home. And I think that really does, for me, connect back to the ethos that Chris has sort of created with the communion collective that until the communion collective came to be, I didn't actually give language to in the way that mm-hmm. I can today. Right. Right. So some of the value proposition then, and there are many, many, but, um, you know, Chris, in terms of the work that you're doing is to be able to sort of help, help folks have a conversation about the outcomes that we're collectively looking for, I would assume. Mm -hmm. So I'm super curious, um, you know, as we continue the conversation, what, what, what is next in the journey, right? So if you think about, you know, and I, I don't mean the, and it doesn't even have to be the big giant long-term aspirational <laughs> goal, but what are you working on right now that you feel like is critically important to our community? And I, the community within post-secondary, community, the community in Columbus, community in Ohio, it, more broadly than that, but, but what, what is it that you want people to walk away from this conversation, thinking about from a sort of action opportunity? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think one of the first things, I don't know if it's, if it's as clear to the listeners and so I'll I'll name it. Um, Part of the impetus to to begin the communion collective was because I, I existed within organizations and institutions that I felt in some ways um, did not allow me to f- fully walk in mm-hmm. um, my, my, my vision. And I want to name that, right? Like, so this, this, is not, this is not an organization that exists within 
Ohio State. It's, right, it's, right. it's not a, it's not an organization that exists within like a church. And this is an independent movement that I'm trying to to help push forward. And and I want to be honest about the fact that sometimes you have visions and you have dreams and ideas that are not meant to exist within certain spaces that you occupy. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that they they um, aren't you know true that they won't come to fruition. It just means that like the current places that you're within may not be meant for it. Right. So certainly there are things that I can, that I did bring and I continue to bring during my time at Denison and Ohio State, but the communion collective is, is outside of all of that. Yeah. yeah. And part of it was because I had some challenges in my journey with trying to do it. And I see Derek smile. I had some challenges yeah. trying to do it within a certain institution. So that's one of the persons I just wanted to name for the listeners to be clear about that, that it is an independent organization. Um, but what in terms of what I'm, what I'm working on, so I am um, I'm heavily situated within um, some K through 12 schools, mm -hmm. having conversations with teachers, uh, getting in front of students. A lot of uh, teachers and professionals within the school system are interested in how to, to better connect with mm -hmm. black and brown students, how to better support black and brown students. And so um, one of the things that I, I'm, I'm continuing to work on and really trying to just continue to hone in terms of my message is um, some of the things that we've known for quite some time, right? We, we, we've had tons and tons and tons of black women scholars and thinkers and intellectuals over decades who have told us about some of the ingredients that are necessary for the success of black and brown children. And so I spend time honestly trying to, 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 to represent that, right? Like to, to go back to what we've known for a long time is helpful when we think about how to support black and brown students, right? Culturally relevant pedagogy coming out back in the early nineties still has relevance today, mm -hmm. still has power today, still has meaning today. Right. And I think it takes time for us to go back and actually consider the work of Dr. Gloria Lassen Billings mm -hmm. and figure out how we can like bring that into today's. But part of my work is is going back and remembering mm -hmm. what we've been taught long ago that we forgot along the way or maybe folks never knew. So that's something I'm working on right now and really trying to I think you, you even offered it. How do you how do you operationalize? Right. What's, mm -hmm. what's the methodology behind love? I love praxis. Right. Like I try my best to, to, to package that in ways that teachers can understand it. So that's one of the first things that I'm working on that I, I want to continue to push and hopefully, you know, make positive impact within the school system. But I'm also writing quite a bit. So we talked about some of my work around masculinities, um, anti-heteronormative masculinities, trying to push back against some of the, the patriarchal ways of, of being and doing that, that many of us have been socialized within this Western world. And so I create spaces for folks to wrestle with those tensions, to have the kind of conversations where we interrogate who we are and who we want to be. And we actually don't just dream about that, but we, we try to put in practice what it looks like to exist in a world where white supremacy isn't the norm, right. where heteronormativity isn't the norm. And so I'm also very much committed to that work, not just in prax practice, but also writing about it. Mm -hmm. So I have some, some, some current papers that are in the works that will be coming out very soon. Um, I'm also very much committed into like creating more spaces for folks to come together. That's not based on a particular religious affiliation. It's not based on denomination. If you if you feel connected to the spirit of love, if you feel connected to the spirit of relationship, regardless of your identities, regardless of how you show up in the world, like you can enter into this space. And I'm interested in like building that out more, continuing to push it forward, speaking on podcasts like this one, mm -hmm. and reminding the world that like love still matters. Love is still important. And if I'm drawing on the words of Bell Hooks, I think part of the issue that we're having in our world is we exist in this lovelessness space. Mm -hmm. Folks are yearning for love. Folks want love. And I think we can all do a better job of trying to demonstrate it in our practice. Absolutely. And you know, Chris, you're an anthropologist at heart. You just, you know, <laughs> didn't put that label on it. So, you know, I'm going to officially invite you to be, you know, part of that crew because you you, you, my friend, are a true, true anthropologist at heart. So um, I love that about that, uh, about you. So thank you for that. <laughs> I, I appreciate I'll take that. I'll take that. That's a new one for me. I don't know if I'll identify that. I haven't had that label yet. Nobody's okay. given that to me. Well, yeah. you know, and you know, la labels, like you said, sometimes we put names on things and it, it's powerful, you know, and in the, the space where I occupy, I spend so much time trying to get folks collectively to think about, well, wh wh what about the humanity 
element of no matter what it is that we're talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a, a project that I do every fall actually uh, with my a Metro um, early college high school kiddos um, in, the, in the, the, they have a program called the Bodies Program, which is all about healthcare. And, you know, several years ago, um, and most of those kids, not all of them, but most of those kids end up at Ohio State, right? So they become part of the ecosystem um, that, 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 that Derek gets to see sort of from, from that, that, that lens. And, you know, one of the things that's lost, for, especially for the kiddos that go into, um, you know, medical school or nursing school or a lot of these different sort of veins, whatever that happens to be for that individual, is that they, you know, they spend so much time focusing on the academics, you know, getting, getting the content that they forget about what the end result is. You know, why did you go there in the first place, right? I wanted to go into healthcare because I want to help people broadly. But if I can't speak to people broadly, how could I possibly help them all, right? And so we've, we've over several years crafted a program um, that we run in their um, fall semester of that early college experience before they go off into the OSU labs and they do their capstones and all that sort of stuff to help them figure out, you know, about the humanness of the people that they're going to encounter and to help them recognize that, you know, um, just because you see something doesn't mean that it's real, right? If you can't figure out to, to identify and to connect with people, how to ask questions and how to ask questions of questions and how mm -hmm. to really, um, you know, step back from your assumptions and the biases that you walk into every moment with. You're not going to uncouple them, right? But you do need to be able to understand and recognize them. And if you can, if you can wrestle with that enough, that my hope is that you will be a better caregiver because you will care about the patient first and foremost and the system in which you're practicing less. And I, a, I just, I want to, I want to push that if I, if I can, you know, please. I, I am, uh, I've grown very frustrated at times with, I'm trying to use my words wise, I've grown frustrated at times with how quickly folks run to practice. Mm -hmm. And I get it, right? Like you're in front of me, you're telling me this, <clears throat> this framework, this theory is, is great, but like, tell me how to, how to implement it. Mm -hmm. And I, I get it, right? You want to know, you want to, you want to take away like two or three nuggets from this conversation that can help you immediately shift wherever it is you work particularly for me, mostly teachers in classrooms. Mm -hmm. My frustration with that though is, you're so eager to shift the practice that I don't know if you're spending as much time engaging in the self work mm -hmm. that is necessary to really be the, the practitioner that folks desire to be, right? And so, um, and this is part of the reason why I am like, you know, transparent about my own work and my own journey. And all of these spaces that I exist in, like I'm also trying to do the work, I'm also, wondering how I can better show up. Derek talked about being um, a thought partner for me. You know, many of our conversations are, hey, Derek, did I drop the ball? <laughs> did I miss the mark? Like, could I have been better? Right? I'm, I'm replaying scenarios and asking him as a brother, like, how, how, could, I, how could I be better, right? Because I'm not perfect. Mm -hmm. And so I think, while, while I understand folks want to understand practice, what I really, really want to encourage you to do is to engage in that self-work. Because the truth of the matter is, like, love cannot exist alongside domination. So if there are ways in which you are actually engaged in sexism, homophobia, classism, ableism, right? Like any, any of those phenomenons, right? Like, and you're not doing that self-work, it doesn't matter what kind of practice you bring into the classroom. You are still unintentionally harming the people that you're in relationship with. Mm -hmm. And so I really want folks to just sit with that, right? Like reflection, interrogation, having people around you to hold you accountable, those things are what help us to get closer to love, not, not accumulating a ton of strategies and techniques to shift our practice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that, Chris. I, you know, I, I think that that is a, it's a wonderful moment for us to, to celebrate and close the conversation. So um, I want to thank both of you for taking time out of your day to come and have this conversation with me and to share with our listeners. And so I am ever so grateful um, for you gentlemen to um, be in my space and to be part of our community. So thank you so much for what you do. And thank you for the conversation today. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for having us and for just creating a space for us to be able to share. We appreciate Absol it. Absolutely.